He was in school finishing up. He put himself through school too. And I was um, in pharmaceutical sales, but a little bit antsy. And right next to my dad's business where he worked part-time, and I would go visit my dad obviously too a lot over in Parker, was one of the first doggy daycares in the state. And we would go watch the dogs play. And it was just this big warehouse. And we were like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest (laughs) business ever. And we'd ask Debbie, the owner, like, can we franchise someday? She goes, oh, I just want my one. You go do your thing. I don't think she thought I'd do what I did. Support for this show comes from Exit Factor. Exit Factor offers a proven method that helps small to mid-sized business owners maximize their company's value. Through one-to-one consulting services and online programs, The trusted advisors at Exit Factor teach entrepreneurs how to successfully navigate and fully leverage strategies when buying, building, and selling their companies. Participants that follow the program have experienced considerable results, with some increasing business value as much as 57% in one year. It's time to start running your business every day like you are going to sell it. Learn more at exitfactor.com backslash pod. Now enjoy How I Sold. Welcome to How I Sold, presented by Exit Factor. Only 13% of all businesses in the U.S. are sold, but we only hear about the billion-dollar stories. Here we explore the real-life stories of entrepreneurs and business owners like you that were able to build, grow, and sell their small businesses. Now, here is your business exit expert, number one best-selling author and host, Jessica Fiakovich. Welcome to How I Sold. I'm Jessica Fiakovich, and I created this podcast after spending over a decade in mergers, acquisitions, and exits, and noticing that we always hear the stories of the unicorn sales. You know, those companies valued out of over a billion dollars or more, but we don't often hear about the real life stories, the stories of the thousands of entrepreneurs every year that build, grow and sell their small businesses. These are their stories. So today on the show, what happens when the world tells you no? We're going to explore the art of the comeback with Heidi Ganahl as she overcame obstacles that most of us would never imagine including the death of her first husband at just 27 and her journey to found the world's largest pet care franchise, Camp Bow Wow. She turned this lifelong passion for dogs into a $150 million brand, hitting the Inc. 500 or 5,000 list five years in a row after starting the company with just $80,000. With a passion to give back, she also founded the Bow Wow Buddies Foundation, which rehomed over 10,000 pups and raised over a million dollars for animal health care causes while she was building that brand during her tenure as founder and CEO. This is Heidi's story. Welcome back to How I Sold. And today I'm super excited. I have one of my closest friends, a mentor to me, a true entrepreneur, a true small business advocate. And I'm really excited to tell her story of how she built one of the largest pet care franchises in the country. Welcome to the show, Heidi Ganahl. Oh, thanks, Jess. I'm so honored and proud to be here. And uh, boy, you are a rocket star, a rock star entrepreneur as well. So I'm blessed to be in the same company. Yeah. Well, so I don't kick off anybody's intro with their bio because we're really we're going to go from your the story from start the very beginning all the way through your journey. So let's just start very beginning. Like, where's Heidi from? Where did you grow <laughs> up? What was your life like as a kid? <laughs> Well, I had a wonderful family upbringing. My parents grew up in Southern California for the most part. And so I was born in Costa Mesa, California. And uh, my folks didn't have a lot of money. They got married early at 18 and 20. They met at a beach party of all things. And they, they were just super inspired though to live a big life. And even though they didn't get to college, they wanted big things for their kids. So when I was about 12, uh, they moved us in the baby blue Pinto station wagon. They packed it up and drove... <laughs> to Monument, Colorado, this little town by the Air Force Academy, and decided that was a good place for us to live when we could learn to hike and fish and do all the things that, um, you know, kids in California don't always get the opportunity to do and just live a simpler life. So that's where I went to middle school and high school. What uh, what inspired them for Colorado? Like, did you have family out here? I mean, like Colorado, what, what, so what, take us back. What year was this? This is not when everyone was flocking to Colorado, right? <laughs> no. 
It was back in 1978 and Colorado was still pretty undeveloped. And my dad had a job opportunity. They said you could go to California or you could stay in California, you could go to Arizona or you could go to Colorado. And so they came out here and checked it out. And funny enough, um, I think four other families that we knew in Southern California moved out here with us. Like we all like came out together and they're like cousins to me now. And we discovered it together, grew up together. And they're still some of my closest friends. Um, but it was just an incredible journey. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. And it's, I mean, Monument back in those days, really small town and Costa Mesa, probably not as small. So that was, was that a big adjustment for you moving to a smaller oh town? Life? <laughs> yes. I remember looking up in the back seat of the Pinto wagon up at the Glenwood Canyon thinking, what are we doing? Where are we? I miss my grandparents already and my cousins. And I, you know, I didn't know what to expect. In my first day of school, I show up wearing my pink checkerboard vans and the kids, our class was very small and the kids are like, who are you? Oh my gosh. I still remember that. And I, um, yeah, I ended up, uh, um, those people ended up being some of my closest friends and I give them a hard time for giving me a hard time, but yeah, the pink checkerboard vans are still a thing. In fact, my parents, when I launched my campaign for governor gave me brand new ones to wear out on the campaign trail. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. You know, what's, uh, what's, I think is really interesting is you made that change and, and we'll talk a little bit about school, but some of the, I know you're still close to some of the friends you grew up with in monument. So obviously that was that transition hard or tell us a little bit about school life, middle school through high school and monument. What was that like for you? Yeah, middle school and high school was awesome. I had a really good experience. Um, I mean, we had 90 kids in my graduating class, so it was small. Yeah. And we all, you know, it was clicky, but not like um, there were the farmers and ranchers kids. And then there, there were kind of the um, the athletes, et cetera. I kind of went back and forth between all the groups. I just really enjoyed um, getting super involved. I was in student council. I was a cheerleader. I, my parents helped bring soccer to Colorado because when we moved here, there was no youth soccer here. So they started the first AYSO team in Monument. And so I loved soccer and we started it at the high school. My folks did. And so I played soccer. That was a big part of my life. And then I coached it for many years after. And now one of my four kids plays soccer. The other three are like, eh. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was wonderful. I worked at Dairy Queen. That was uh, my job. I saved up all my money to go to college because I wanted to go out and make it big. And I got a scholarship to go to SMU first. And um, so that's where I started my college career. Yeah. So when you, when you're in high school and getting ready for college, like, did you think you were going to be an entrepreneur? Like what did, what would, what did you want to be when you grew up? No, I was very passionate about being an advertising account executive. My aunt and uncle um, lived in Irvine, California, and I would go out there in the summers and intern for them. And it was awesome. I loved it because I'm super creative. Like our whole family's creative. My creativity came out in entrepreneurship, but my um, like my dad's a great artist. Um, you know, my uh, my uncle is a musician. Like everybody has kind of their thing, but it's all creative. And so... Um, you know, I just, I really wanted to get into advertising and I did end up getting into advertising after I graduated from college for a short time, but, um, it was, yeah, that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. Oh, interesting. Okay. So you get this scholarship, you go to SMU, which, uh, for listeners who don't know is down in Dallas, Texas, another big change. So what was it like transition? Well, first of all, how, how did you pick SMU? Was it just because of the scholarship or was there other reasons for that? Well, my dad grew up in Texas for the most part in Richardson and Corpus Christi. So when I wanted to go outside of Colorado and make it big in college, um, we started looking at schools where I could get a scholarship because they, my folks didn't have a lot of resources. And I'd saved up a little bit of money, not that much. And so I looked at um, Pepperdine and I really wanted to go to Pepperdine um, and SMU and a couple other schools. And SMU gave me a great scholarship. And I love the campus. I loved Texas. So I go down there, I show up in my 66 Mustang and didn't know what a Louis Vuitton or a Rolex was, which at SMU is kind of a prerequisite, <laughs> yeah. wearing my Levi 501s. And I was kind of a fish out of water. So I did fine, but I was super homesick and I, I just didn't really understand the, you know, the big oil money kind of world. And so by Christmas time, I was like, oh, I don't know if this is a good fit for me. So I wanted to transfer um, to a different school. 
And my folks were like, just stick it out to the end of the year. Well, by the end of the school year, I really loved it and I didn't want to leave. But um, by then it was kind of, you know, I, I hadn't reapplied to go there for my scholarship. So it was time to move on. And over that next summer, my dad lost his job and my folks were like, oh, this is going to be really tough. So I went to live with my grandparents for a bit that next year and worked two different jobs and went to Cal State Fullerton for a while to kind of get my feet back on the ground until I ended up back in Boulder. Okay. Wow. So really, you know, you you leave the the scholarship behind SMU and then you take on funding your own college experience from there, working to save up money to make sure you get the right education for your future career in advertising. Yes. And I mean, I was very, very close to my grandparents, my dad's parents, as close to my, all my grandparents, but um, we were um, just great friends. And so it was really a good experience. And I worked my tail off. Like I was up at 6 a.m. and gone till 10 at night working the two jobs and going to school. And um, it really just brought things together for me about what I wanted to do kind of with my life and where I wanted to go and how um, assertive I wanted to be on building a career. And that's kind of when I think I got a taste of, yeah, I want to go out and kind of do something fun and big. And, you know, I, I don't want to play small. Yeah. What What do you think that was? Why was that transition there for you? Was it the where you were working at the time or just, you know, a mindset transition you were having at that age? I think it was more realizing that it was, this was up to me. Like I didn't have a safe landing necessarily. I mean, my folks loved me and gave me as much support as they could, but I realized that I needed to go out and make it on my own and um, figure this out. And so it was kind of like being shoved off a cliff, you know, you're like, okay, I got to do this. And that's kind of why I went into, oh gosh, I'm going to work two jobs and, you know, go really hard at college, try and get this done and go out and, you know, start my career out in the world. Yeah. So you've got two years under your belt, one at SMU, one at Cal State Fullerton. Now you're back in Boulder um, at mm -hmm. the University of Colorado, I assume, right? Yes. And I love to tell this story. My first football game at CU when I got when I got there was the Nebraska CU game where we beat Nebraska. It was under McCartney. And that like never happened back then. <laughs> And so I was so spoiled already. I was like, oh, this is how it's supposed to go. We beat Nebraska at football, but it was super fun. And I ended up um, making some great friends right away. And just, it just felt so perfect. Like it was, it was where I was supposed to be, where I belonged. And so for the next couple of years, just had a really good time, um, went into the business school, got a marketing degree and loved my time at CU. Nice. So that that transition, marketing, focus on there, feel like you're back home. Is that the transition then when you went into the advertising world? Not quite yet. Um, I, um, gosh, I did a lot of work for the CU Business Research Division. So I did a lot of research into companies in Colorado and what made them tick and help them write reports. And so I started to realize um, kind of what industries were doing really well and where there were job opportunities. This was in 88. Um, but I still had a heart for advertising. So I did move to California, back to California to San Diego and work for an ad agency there and then one in Newport Beach. Loved every minute of it. Um, but, um, got homesick again and decided to come back. But funny story, my favorite advertising story is when I was working for Chapman Warwick in, in San Diego, one of my managers said to me, Hey, um, and I was like a junior account manager, like slash receptionist slash administrative assistant. Yeah. It's like, I've got this, um, one of our clients was Samuel Goldwyn. She said, I've got this client up in LA that we need to get to a movie premiere. Do you want to go and in the ride with it? The, the movie star. She's just an up and comer. I'm like, no, I've got plans tonight. I'm okay. It turned out to be Julia Roberts. Um, oh my God. Up and comer. I was like, what? But anyway, lots of fun stories like that. But I was homesick. So I came back after two great years in San Diego and got a job in pharmaceutical sales. And mm. that's where my journey into sales and marketing in that world came about. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, you you bounced around a little bit through the this first like 20 some years like California, Colorado, Texas, California, but it feels like Colorado just kept pulling you back. Like that's like where you truly were meant to be. I totally think that. Um, you know, it's just you know where your heart is, like you can kind of feel that tug like you talked about and 
I just, it's so beautiful inside and out. I love the people of this state and it's just got such a, um, like a wild, wild west mentality. Like you can go big and do anything. And that's kind of how I roll. And so I think we just fit together really well, but I was in pharmaceutical sales and I, I liked it, but I called it, you know, kind of the golden handcuffs. Like it's a great job. And I was so blessed to have the opportunity and got to work for some really big companies like, um, Bristol Myers Squibb and Johnson and Johnson, but I was just like antsy. And my first husband and I uh, would sit around and write ideas, business ideas on the back of restaurant napkins and just dream up business ideas. And that's where my first click for entrepreneurship came about. Yeah. So you're in sales, you're learning. You just mentioned too. You, so what, what age are we at now? You just got married at this point too? Well, I met Brian, I think when I was uh, 23 and we got um, married a couple years later at 25. And so um, great guy, super entrepreneurial, just um, beautiful spirit. And we just had so much fun dreaming up all these business ideas. And he was just super um, ambitious too. His favorite saying was um, seize the day or carpe diem. And he lived life to the max every single day and kind of taught me that too, that approach to life. I was already kind of like that, but uh, we were both as a couple just constantly doing things to push the envelope. And um, so he was in school finishing up. He put himself through school too. And I was um, in pharmaceutical sales, but a little bit antsy. And right next to my dad's business where he worked part-time, and I would go visit my dad obviously too a lot over in Parker, was one of the first doggy daycares in the state. And we would yeah. go watch the dogs play. And it was just this big warehouse. And we were like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest <laughs> business ever. And we'd ask Debbie, the owner, like, can we franchise someday? And she goes, oh, I just want my one. You go do your thing. I don't think she thought I'd do what I did. But... <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, little did she know. So was that where the, yeah, like Camp Bow Wow started coming together on the back of that napkin when you guys were brainstorming? Yeah, we were like, oh, this is so cool. And our dogs loved it. But how could we go bigger with the idea? And Doggy daycare was kind of popping up around the scene, around the country, like in Chicago and New York, obviously just get starting out in, Cal in Colorado. And this was in 94. Um, and so we took that idea and built Camp Awa around it, like with, you know, a cool mountain lodge theme. And obviously um, the technology wasn't quite there yet, but we added boarding and grooming and training, like the happiest place on earth for dogs is what we wanted to create. Yeah. So you've got this great plan. You've got a great partner by your side, really pulling out your entrepreneurial spirit. But as we know, life doesn't go exactly how we plan it or we want it to go. So you hit a stumbling block along the way, right? Yeah. Um, Brian's 25th birthday was coming up and he was almost done with college. He had maybe 12 credits left to go. And um, my folks ran into an old family friend, um, Cliff, who had a stunt plane. Um, he did air shows. He was a United Airlines pilot of 30 years, um, good family friends for Monument. And he said, hey, um, I should take you guys, take you up in the plane. It's really fun. I'm having a ball with it. And um, so they were like, yeah, let's um, let's take buying up for a surprise. And uh, the whole family thought that was a great idea. Like, oh, my gosh, he loves doing, you know, adventurous stuff like that. So um, they surprised him. I stayed home for a community garage sale we had in Parker. And they did all the stunts, went to do a flyby over my folks, and the plane crashed into the ground. And Brian and Cliff were both killed instantly. And obviously, my life changed dramatically at that point. Yeah. I mean, here you are, like you're in your mid-20s, which for most of us at this point, we're all invincible, right? And now you have to bury your first husband, your first love. I mean, it's just so much to deal with. How how do you recover from that? Gosh, that's, I don't know that you ever like recover, but you learn to live with it. Um, mm -hmm. And you just push forward. And with Brian's spirit and his push to live life to the fullest every day, I mean, it took me a long time to heal from it. And boy, I made a lot of mistakes um, in the following years. But I also made some good decisions and um, I still feel the spirit of buying all the time with whatever I'm doing and that carpe diem seize the day mentality that he instilled in me. Um, but what got me out of bed, I mean, within a few months, um, we're, you know, of really getting back into life were my dogs. And one of the things I don't talk a lot about, but it's such a cool story is after um, the plane crash, I decided um 
kind of get do a, like something to get back into life. And I'd been laid off from my pharmaceutical job. So I didn't have a job at the time, which was not good because mm -hmm. I just didn't have like a purpose or anything to do every day. But I had the two dogs and I thought, I'm going to raise a canine companion puppy, um, you know, for the, um, for the assistant dogs. And so I signed up to do it and they said, oh, it'll probably be four to six months before you get one. Well, I ended up getting a call a few weeks later and they said, actually, we just got this golden retriever puppy donated are you ready to go? And I was like, oh, oh, okay. So I get this eight week old golden retriever puppy named Ori that I need to train. And in order to train them, you have to take them everywhere with you to the grocery store on the airplane. And I have this eight week old little fluff, you know? Oh. And what happens when you carry around an eight week old golden retriever? Everybody wants to talk to you and yep. come up and, you know, hear the story. And so it really pushed me back into life. And I, I worked really hard to train her, but Ori ended up flunking out of the program <laughs> and because she, she got a little too possessive with other dogs and stuff. And so I like to say she was my guardian angel and my service dog. And turns out she was born like the day after the plane crash. So I just think that was an omen, you know, that she was supposed to help me get back out into life. And she did. She was an amazing dog. Yeah. It's one of those things like you wonder about spirits and souls and if she was brought into this world to save you rather than the other way around right yeah for whatever reason she sure did help me get back into life and really kind of cemented my belief that dogs i mean they're just little angels on earth they're they're just filled with unconditional love as you know I mean, we both are super passionate about our pups and and uh it just yeah it really brought me back to life mm. So here you are, you've got these, you know, these two dogs that you're taking care of, you're, you're laid off from your pharmaceutical job. Like, so is this, this the point? Is this the point where you're going to launch you and Bayan's dream of the happiest place on earth for dogs? No, actually not. Like I, it, it was always in the back of my mind, but in the meantime, I, I got a settlement from the plane crash, pretty big settlement. And I managed to just ugh, mess it up. I was just not in a good state of mind. I ended up giving lots of loans to family and friends to start businesses or do whatever. And I spent a lot on just trying to fill my em empty tank, you know, trying to figure mm -hmm. out what to do with my life. And I'd never had any money. So I didn't really understand how to manage it. And emotionally, I wasn't, you know, in a good place to manage it. So fast forward five years. In the meantime, I'd gotten remarried and to a, a guy I'd known since I was 12, Kirk, who I'm very dear friends with now, but, um, you know, I was nowhere near ready to get remarried. Um, and, but we had Tori out of the deal, my daughter, who's 27 now, and it was such a gift. Tori was an amazing gift to me and got me back on track. Um, so kind of go through that. I end up not staying married very long on that second marriage because I was not in a good state and Kirk wasn't either. And um, so we split ways and fast forward a couple more years. My brother comes to me who's seven years younger and he's like, Heidi, you've lost your mojo. Like, let's get it back. And I'm like, I'm a single mom now. I've lost most of the settlement. I have like 80 grand left in a retirement account. And he's like, let's just roll the dice and start one of those businesses you wrote up on the, on the back of the restaurant napkins. And I was like, well, okay, if we find the right site, then I'll do it. And so we found an old veterans of foreign war hall. And that's where we started the first camp bow out in the year 2000. And I took that 80 grand and put it into the business and off we went. <laughs> Roll the dice, carpe diem, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell us about those beginning days, like that first location with camp bow wow. What, what was it like? What was it like building a business with your brother and like just learning <laughs> as you go? Well, I like to kid with him and other people that we fired each other like three times, but <laughs> yeah. we're very different. So he was really good at the day-to-day -day operations and handling the dogs and, and the customers. And I was really good at going out and building new business. And so I take Tori, who was a little one at that point, you know, four years old, and we'd go to Wash Park and Platte Park because the Camp Awa was right off Santa Fe in Mississippi and um, hand out milk bones. We'd have a bucket of milk bones and a certificate for a free day at camp. And that's how we marketed Camp Bow Wow back then. This was in 2000. So, you know, there wasn't any fancy digital marketing. And um, people were like, what? You want to babysit my dogs during the day? I thought it was the weirdest idea. And then I kind of took my model from pharmaceutical sales and I would go into veterinary clinics and ask to talk to the vets. And I would bring food like we did in pharmaceutical sales and coupons. And they were like, young lady, you're going to hurt yourself or the dogs are going to hurt each other. 
And I was like, no, they really love it. They love being there. And so I'd get them to come and see the place. And they, they thought, wow, this is really cool. It actually works. So that was the first marketing plan for Camp Bow Wow until um, my brother thought of this brilliant idea to put a webcam on a stick. Yeah. We'll get to that in a second because that's one of my favorite things that you guys did. But I, I want to back up a little bit because this is like, we, we think now we're sitting here in 2022 and you could do anything you want with your dogs, right? There's daycares, there's doggy hike groups, there's all kinds of stuff like dogs swim together. But like, what was what was the reception both from like, a, a government regulation perspective and like what what did you have to overcome in that mindset of people of like are the dogs going to hurt each other are they going to fight like how how did that work that play out for you all well a couple things one was um i needed to figure out how to train my employees um on how to deal with the dogs right because there wasn't like a, a manual back then and so i went up to csu and i met with a behavioralist up there and they were super helpful and what we did is we took um, the wolf pack mentality and the signs that wolves show when they're like getting upset or agitated or when they're happy. And I remember the first training um, sheet for the employees was a picture of wolves and how they like show symbols of when they're stressed or excited or happy. And we kind of took that and applied it to dogs, believe it or not, yeah. and built a whole training manual with CSU's help and the behaviorists up there on how to manage a yard, like a play yard full of dogs. And so that was super helpful. And that's kind of how we built the operations manual on how to um, do your job at Camp Bawa and then for how the franchisees, how to build their business. But one of the things that I call this the moment I got into politics was when I was standing in the play yards and this guy walks in from the city of Denver and he says, what are you doing here? And I'm like, doggy daycare. And he's like, uh, this, you don't have a conditional use permit, do you? And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. He said, your broker didn't make you get that. I'm like, no. So the real estate broker, I guess, was supposed to know, I don't know how they would know this, that we needed a conditional use permit to do a, a service like this. So he drags me down to the city of Denver and has this big book because you don't have the internet back then. He's flipping through and he's like, I don't even know how to classify this business. And he goes, are you a kennel? I'm like, well, no, we don't do overnight boarding at that point. Mm -hmm. He goes, all right, I'm going to call you warehousing of commodities. And the commodities are pets. I was like, what? Uh, okay, what does that mean? He goes, well, I'm also going to protect you from yourself and I'm going to limit you to 15 dogs a, uh, a day in your place. And I'm like, what? We can't make any money then. Yeah. And so it was my first experience with government coming in and knowing better than us how to run our business. And there are lots more instances like that, but it, it launched a whole um, mindset about you know running the business that we had to figure out how to um, go, get through zoning and planning commissions and stuff as we grew later on. And that was my first experience with it. Yeah. When you, I mean, when you're building a category, right. And I mean, and this is, this is an extreme, right. Cause you're dealing with live animals. So the reaction is very different, but you're building a category. It's very hard to navigate that. Cause you don't even know what challenges you're going to face. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Every day is an adventure, but that's the fun of it too. Um, I mean, Gosh, there's so many different challenges we faced over the years that we were so blessed to get through and, and navigate. Um, the government just got in the way every which way but loose. I mean, it was shocking to me how one of the hardest parts of building a business and growing a brand was not knowing how the government was going to make it harder, whether it was new regulations, taxes, fees, zoning permits, um, different like different ways we had to clean the kennels. Like here, eventually we had all these camp hours across the country and the government would be saying, you have to switch to using X, Y, Z to clean your places. And we're like, what do you mean? We have a great track record. Mm. It was just mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot to overcome. But, you know, I think at this point in your life, you had built that adversity muscle so much, right? So mm -hmm. you, you apply that and you, you figure out how to overcome each of these challenges, each of these little adversities along the way, and you apply innovation to the business. So let's jump back into that first innovation. I love this story. Um, tell everybody how, because now, now it is too, everybody, you know, we drop our dogs off at daycare. We watch them on the webcams, on our <laughs> phones, on our, our PCs, things like that. I think, you know, this is my favorite part because like you guys came up with that. So tell us like, how did that come to fruition? Well, it was 
Um, probably, let's see, we opened in late 2000. So this was probably mid 2001. And because of that zoning inspector, we ended up moving a couple blocks away where we could have a, a bigger number of dogs and do boarding. So we ended up right behind the old Breakfast King in Santa Fe and Mississippi from when we were originally on South Broadway. And, um, we had the, that was the first place we did the lodge pole fencing and kind of the camp look. And my brother's very techie and he's now a sound engineer. And he's like, Hey, there's this new thing called webcams and it hooks to the internet. It like takes a picture and posts to the internet. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's the coolest idea. Let's put one up on one of the posts and see if it can take a picture of the dogs and post to the internet. And so we tried it out and it worked beautifully. But back then, high definition video streaming was a picture every 60 seconds that you could barely make out, you know, what was in the picture. Yeah. And so um, we um, did that. The customers loved it. But every 60 seconds, they'd you'd have to like if somebody wanted to see their dog, like hold the dog up to the camera and wait for it to take the picture. <laughs> yeah. So Half of our time was spent holding wiggly labs in the play yards you know, to get a picture and to post to the internet. So, but it was beautiful and it took off from there. We ended up having a Rover cam that would we put on one of the dogs that you could follow the dog around. <laughs> and now it's like 16 cameras, 16 high definition yeah. cameras in the camps. And you can see everything, the fur on the dogs. <laughs> yeah. So obviously the customer reaction was over the top, right? They love seeing their, their dogs on camera. Yes, yeah. very much so. And it was uh, just... Super fun. Like it took the business to a whole nother level. So between that and then the ability to get through zoning and, and planning commissions and stuff, once we started franchising, things kind of took off because of those two things. But yeah. So why franchising? Why did you guys pursue franchising for your next step in growth? Well, Jess, I mean, I... I invested every penny I had into growing the first location. And then we opened a second one up in Broomfield because a client of ours had a, a dad who was a vet who wanted to open one next door to his. And I was maxed out on every credit card and taken out a home equity loan, like everything you're not supposed to do, loans from family and friends. And so I didn't have a lot of capital. And one of our clients at the second camp said, have you ever thought about franchising? And I was like, not really. And he said, why don't you come with me to the International Franchise Association Conference and just check it out? Because no one was franchising doggy daycare or boarding in that pet space at all back then. And this was 2003. And so I went with him. I met some amazing people who'd been in franchising a long time who agreed to mentor me. And um, one of which was Kevin Hine, who's um, a big franchise attorney in Denver, who still is a friend of mine. And... Um, they were like, yeah, I think this might work. So we put together the UFOC back then. It was called yep. before it was an FDD and put some signs up on both camps and said, anybody interested in opening a franchise of Camp Bellow? And Nancy Roddy came in and said, yeah, I'm actually interested. And she had two beagles and she lived in Castle Rock. So our very first franchise was in Castle Rock, Colorado. When we come back in just a moment, how an unlikely event took the Camp Bow Wow franchise model to new heights and how they struggled through the next phase of their growth, which coincided with the recession, supporting their new franchisees. Stay with us. I'm Jessica Fiakovich, and you are listening to How I Sold. Support for this show comes from Exit Factor. Have you ever wondered if your business is sellable? The truth is thousands of businesses sell every year from just a few thousand dollars to billions. Now, there are a ton of experts that will teach you how to start a business, more on how to grow one, but only Exit Factor will teach you how to build a valuable and efficient business that is sellable at any time, no matter what happens. Visit exitfactor.com backslash pod to learn more about us and take our free assessment to find out if your business is sellable. That's exitfactor.com backslash pod. Hey, welcome back to How I Sold. I'm Jessica Fiakovich, and we're with Heidi Ganahl, founder of Camp Bow Wow. Now, so far through our story, she's been through some ups and downs already, losing her first husband buy-in in a plane accident and almost losing all that settlement money, but taking that last $80,000 and investing it into the first doggy daycare location. After a mention of franchising from a client, she decided it was the right time for the industry and for her business. But everything doesn't go exactly to plan. Sometimes when you're the leader in a field, you face the headwinds and break down walls for those that follow. And it was no different for Heidi. 
So now you're franchising, growing through franchising, which is a is a great way to franchise. Like you mentioned, like you don't need to do the capital to expand the brand across the, the U.S. You also put a lot of other people into business, right? Create entrepreneurs. So was was the goal when you did this to become the number one doggy daycare franchise in, in the country or to get as big as eventually Camp Bow Wow was? Or what, what did you think it would become at that point? Well, the funny thing is before I started franchising, I thought Camp Bow Wow would become a retail like um, clothing brand because you remember Big Dog um, with the St. Oh, Bernard? Yeah. I was like, where are you going with this? Okay. But now, yeah. I, I, know, it was, I think back and I'm like, what? Um, but my uncle who I worked for in the ad agency and I came up with this really cute series of shirts and uh, ideas for all the kind of mugs and paraphernalia um, with Scout, our little logo dog. Um, that would be a brand. And so we were kind of going down that direction. We're like, well, doggy daycare is never going to go big. And as we started opening like the second one, we're like, well, I don't know. So we sold the t-shirts and stuff at the camp and they were popular, but but it didn't take off. Um, And then when we started franchising after Nancy came and opened the Castle Rock one, then we started getting more interest. The internet started taking off a little bit. So Fast forward a couple, about a year and a half, we'd been franchising for a while and I didn't have a lot of resources to put into marketing. So we were kind of eking out one franchise here and there. We had probably eight to 10. And one day the phone starts ringing off the hook. It was middle of the summer, 2005. And there was maybe two other people working with me on the franchise part of Camp Bow Wow. And we couldn't figure out why everybody was so interested that day in franchising with us. Well, come to find out, America Online featured us as the next great franchise. And AOL was the only internet during that time, or one of the only ones. And they had three rotating stories. And it was one of those three rotating stories. And we got over 3,000 franchise sales leads from that one hit on AOL. Wow. And so things just took off from there. And uh, it was, I, I never, well, it took a while to figure out where that came from, like where AOL got it. But it was because yeah. I sat next to a gal from Business Week Online who wrote a small article about women in franchising. I sat next to her at a franchise conference. She put that article up and AOL picked it up and that's how it got out there. I was going to ask, was that like a strategic marketing effort or was <laughs> that... That was that was a little bit of fate and luck at the same time. That was magic. The universe is magic. <laughs> but it did teach me how amazing you know, PR can be and just, you know, doing a good job and getting attention on your business for doing the right things and, and building a great brand. Yeah. So now you've got all these incoming franchise leads. Now, I mean, I'm assuming the business is transitioning. Now it's not just about doggy daycare, but now you're a franchisor, right? And taking and leading entrepreneurship for a whole host of other people across the country. What um, what changes did you face as an entrepreneur, as a leader yourself going through that? Well, for me, it was my sweet spot because what I love to do is go big and build big brands and think very visionary and get people behind and, and focus on the, the big ideas, which I'll talk about now, how I think plays into my governor race. But um. And so for me, it was wonderful. Like I got to build the vision for Camp Bow Wow and, and the brand and um, help other entrepreneurs get involved and build a business around something they loved. So it was kind of, uh, it was just magical and things took off and we were opening franchises all over the country. I built a great team um, and really zoning, that's where zoning and planning came into play. I think I traveled to a hundred different zoning meetings around the country and I would get up and talk about waste, drainage, and noise. Waste, drainage, and noise. That was the thing with doggy daycare and boarding. Because we were doing something very new. We were putting these pet care facilities in urban areas, like in light industrial commercial parks. And usually the zoning folks would want to stick us out in the country. And that wasn't our model. And so a lot of it was paving the way for this idea that we could build these facilities in town. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, because they hadn't thought about that. And then, yeah, the noise and the waste and all that. What did you learn through that process of dealing with so many different regulations, people? I mean, I talk about adversity. Probably every single zoning meeting was adversity to overcome in and of itself. Was there anything you learned how to influence who you're talking to a little bit better? Or was it just data and facts and the research from the previous locations? 
Well, I mean, data and research and facts helps, but it's really an emotional sell. It's, um, it's, gosh, it was just so subjective, subjective, which really bothered me. Like, it, it really depended on who was on the council and who was in the audience. And up to me and the franchisee to um, win people's hearts, which isn't how it should work. It should be very objective. And you should know if you do X, Y, Z, you can go into this space. And that really frustrated me. And it taught me that it, you know, it wasn't fair. It, it, you know, mm-hmm. the government process wasn't fair. It was very subjective and kind of corrupt in some mm-hmm. ways. Um, a lot of times you had to play the game and, I thought this isn't right. Like a lot of great people were stopped from opening, you know, franchise in certain locations because of um, the government, you know, kind of red tape regulations, attitudes, and just anti-business attitudes, um, which we brought amazing jobs to the community. It's a great service. And, you know, it was just really unfortunate when that happened. Yeah. Well, all that aside, you guys really continued to grow, crush it. Each camp Bow Wow became very successful in and of its own in the different locations. But now where are we, where are we timeline wise? Probably what year? We're probably in, uh, we're growing, growing, growing in 2007. Um, and then, yeah. And then the, the 2000, the wonderful year of 2008 hit, which was crazy. Yeah. So let's talk about that because that's, I mean, that 2008, 2009, 2010, it's probably one of the most difficult timeframes for someone to be owning a growing business. How did that affect Camp Bow Wow? And how did you get the company through that? Well, let's start with 2007. Um, Late 2007, things were going great. We were growing like crazy. I got set up on a blind date with a guy named Jason in late 2007, and we hit it off, and he's my current husband. And um, so things were going really well, and we were going to bring some capital into Camp Bow Wow to um, grow the business even bigger. And so January of 2008, I'm working with this big investment company to bring in a few million dollars to help us grow. And they, I get a call on the day before the deal is supposed to close. And you know how hard these deals are to bring in the money and get everything through all the legal, et cetera. And um, they're like, we're going to back out because there's something going on in the market, the consumer market. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Everything's great. And obviously I'm not an economist, but um, I, I, I just didn't see what they saw and they're very sophisticated investors out in New York. And so they backed out of the deal and I was like, Oh, okay. I'm going to keep bootstrapping this. Well, a few months later, the market fell apart crash of um, 2008 happened and it was terrifying. Like people, we didn't know if people were going to keep spending money on their dogs and doggy daycare and boarding and everything just came to a screeching halt. Um, One of the things that happened even before the crash was the SBA decided to stop being so generous with their loans to start franchises. They kind of saw the same thing. And Comerica was our big funder of franchises, and they backed out of our segment, which is like a tier two franchise system, not a startup, but kind of in growth mode. Mm -hmm. And all these franchisees had loans to start their businesses and get going and had already paid their franchise fees. And it was like, oh, my gosh. What are we going to do? They can't, they don't have their loans now to open. Yeah. And so it was really scary. Um, but we decided to roll up our sleeves and to focus on the units that were open, make sure that they could get through this recession or whatever we were headed into and to pull back on the growth. And I got a lecture from my Vistage group, which is like EO or a group of CEOs. Um, I was the only girl in there. There were 10 other guys. They were like my big brothers and they just had a tough love talk with me. Like, You've got to cut down on your staff. You've got to, you know, buckle down and you've got to do everything you can to survive this. Just go into survival mode. And it was really scary, hard to go through, but we did it. We came through the other side and, um, you know, we're a healthier brand because of it. Yeah. What What do you think looking back at that, you know, what is, is there a moment you're most proud of that during that time, a, a call that you made, whether it was downsizing or something you did for a franchise? Boy, I think I was chief cheerleader. I was chief inspiration officer. I just had to keep people's moods up and all the folks that lost their loans, I had to keep them inspired and give them um, hope that they could still open someday. So we started to do that. We started our Home Buddies brand, which was in-home pet care. 
so that they could start that and get going for very little money to kind of buy the time until the market came back and they could get their financing back on track. And then we started Behavior Buddies, which was our training brand. And so that was how we, um, you know, kind of kept them engaged. And there were probably 35, 40 people who were in that situation out of our, you know, maybe 100 franchisees at the time. So it was uh, it was very scary, but we all, you know, hung together and, um, you know, just supported each other. And it taught me, it taught me how much it matters what people's attitudes are and what their um, what their intentions are. And if they really wanted to make it work and they believed that they could, and I believed that they could, then we would work through it together and make it through the other side. Yeah. It's so true. I mean, like your mindset can really set the course of how your actions turn out. And, you know, so I love the chief cheerleader. I also love like you hear lots of these stories about going through recessions and depressions and survival mode where brands become innovative and like some of their most creativity. So that's where the home buddies came in, which is a a whole nother segment that was just getting started of like these dog walking and in-home care brands that again are now, you know, all throughout our, our society. But what wasn't that big at the time. So you guys, you know, you keep everybody together, you keep the spirits up, you get through the the recession, back to growth mode or what's going on in your life right now between the business and <laughs> you got this guy, new guy, Jason, you're dating and what what's going on? <laughs> so what was going on was we decided to get married and have a kid. And I had Tori who was 12 at the time. So I have a teenager. I have this business that I'm trying to get through the recession Um, we, um, have Holly who's now 13. Um, and, um, we decided to try for one more and we get twins out of the deal. (laughs) And so I have three kids under the age of three. Uh, this is 2012 and a teenager. And, um, Jason had just started off. He was, um, had a great career with Tyco healthcare. And then when I had Holly decided to kind of try something different, more entrepreneurial. And so, um, he ended up starting a recruiting business at the same time. And we were juggling being parents too, of course. And then he started judging barbecue contests on the side and this hobby. And before I know it, he decided to start cooking in the barbecue contest and he started winning the contest. So, A lot of weekends, he was off traveling, doing these barbecue contests and doing very well. His thing was taking off. And I decided it was good time to exit and sell Camp Bow Wow because of the kids and because I'm an entrepreneur. I like to, you know, build things and grow things and get them going and running smoothly and then, you know, step off to the next project. So at that point, I decided to research investment, like opportunity, like companies that might want to invest in us or buy us. And so I meet with an investment banker and that's the next chapter. Yeah. So was this like over a time frame where you're thinking like a like strategic exit plan or was it like a wake up one day and you're like, you know what? It's time to move on. Like how much how long of a thought process was this for you? Well, if you go back to um, 2008, when I was thinking about bringing the investor in, that was my long-term plan, right? I'm going to bring an investor in who has a lot of resources. We're going to grow it together and then I'll exit in five or six years and or maybe stay involved, but they'll run run the place. But after I had the kids and made it through the recession, it was pretty exhausting getting Camp Bow Wow through the, the Great Recession. And so I just thought, you know what? I think um, I think it's time to hand my baby Camp Bow Wow off to someone who can take it to the next level. Um, I think it's a different it's a different game to take a company from zero to you know ten million in you know whatever, and, and then ten million to a hundred million. So I kind of had that gut feeling that it was time to let it go a bit and let it go to someone who would take good care of it. And that's when, through the process, we found BCA, um, and the big veterinary chain, and it turned out to be a really good partnership. So th- that deal overall, like, what were your big learning lessons or takeaways from going through selling a business? Because, oh, there's your dog in the background. <laughs> yes, uh, always. <laughs> yeah, right. He's, he knows we're talking about the brand. So... <laughs> What what learning lessons did you have going through that exit? Like, what were you exposed to that you hadn't been exposed to as an entrepreneur before? Going through the exit experience was such a different thing than running the business. Like, you really had to um, tee up the financials so that people 
understood your business model very quickly, easily, and understood the path to um, growing. And so I had to get very clear about what the future looked like for Camp Bow Wow, what I thought the opportunities were, be able to articulate that very well, and to you know, just deal with the emotional side of handing off my business and what that was going to look like for me and for my family and for my employees who I adored and my franchisees. So there was all this emotional stuff that you have to deal with while you're dealing with the financial and the, um, you know, the tactical side of selling your business. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. And I, I mean, I say all the time, it's, it's not a side of business we're exposed to much as entrepreneurs. Like, you know, through Visage and YPO and EO, we get taught a lot about like how to start, how to grow, how to innovate, but there's not a lot of these exit conversations and preparation of how people are going to look at it from a financing perspective, right? And then the second piece, like I want to talk about is that that transition, right? That emotional transition. So you're emotionally letting go through the sale of the business, but like, what did your transition look like as a leader the day after? Like, what did what did Heidi have? What were you responsible for once VCA was the new owners, right? Oh my gosh, it was just such um, an interesting experience. You wake up the next morning, and you know the deal's done, and because the last couple of weeks of the deal are so stressful. I mean, everything that can go wrong will go wrong, and you're trying to keep things, you know, under wraps in case it doesn't go well or something doesn't close and you wake up the next day and it's done. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is like a whole new chapter for me. And all of a sudden you're an employee or you're not the owner. You don't have control over the business anymore. And you have to talk to your employees and your franchisees about what's just occurred. So super emotional, super exciting, but also very sad and humbling. Um, And, it was, I mean, I had a great transition and VCA was very wonderful to work with. And we hired someone to come in and help me run the business and transition out over a year and a half, two years. Remember, I still had the little kids. So it was pretty crazy. My twins were almost two or um, let's see, I guess they would be one and a half, I guess when it happened or maybe two. And so it was, um, it was more an emotional experience than anything. Yeah. So you've got the the kids, obviously you've got a lot going on at home to distract you from the emotional experience, but like, were you running to anything else at that chapter in your life? Like, was there something else that you really wanted to do that was pulling at your heart outside of Camp Bow Wow or business or anything? Yeah, just, I mean, I wanted to give back. I'd felt so blessed to live the American dream and wanted to protect that for my kids and our kids. And I'd already been involved in that a bit with my role at Job Creators Network. I was part of a nonprofit that helps small business owners across the country. Um, but I, I wanted to go all in on that. And so I ended up um, taking a, a good part of the, the money that I got from the sale and kind of earmarking it to start some nonprofits and do some things to help. So I started um, Moms Fight Back, a charity to help moms dealing with really tough stuff. Um, and I also started the fight back foundation, which, you know, well, Mm -hmm. um, which helps entrepreneurs, um, build a business around something they're passionate about, mostly around kids. And then I started, um, a couple other nonprofits. So that became kind of my passion was starting, you know, cool projects with cool people to make a difference in the world. And Mm -hmm. that's where I put my energy. Yeah, I remember. And that's where really where our paths cross. I remember one of the things I, I I quote you most is the cool projects with cool people. That was really at that point in your life, that's where we crossed paths. You were working on cool projects with cool people. Tell us some of the successes you had in, in the nonprofit world that you're very proud of and think maybe even propelled you to your next step. Yeah, I think um, Moms Fight Back, we were able to do some really um, intense but effective research projects around teen sexual assault and then also family court reform um, with victims of domestic violence and child abuse. So um, we were able to really push prosecutors in Colorado to make better decisions about decisions on whether they prosecute cases of teenage sexual assault. So that was really impactful and important to me. We did the Colorado Moms Tour, where we traveled the state and listened to moms and tried to understand what issues were important to them. And not like the fluffy issues, but things like suicide and drug addiction and all the terrible things that we face with our children as moms and worry about. And so getting to listen to moms across Colorado was really 
um, really uh, a great experience for me and being able to help them articulate and advocate for things that they care about. And then we passed a law called Julie's Law with my dear friend, Marilyn McLean, who now runs Moms Fight Back. And it was to train special advocates in courts and eventually judges on how to do better in cases of domestic violence and child abuse and incest in the family court system. And then on Fight Back Foundation, we were able to help um, a lot of um, entrepreneurs launch their businesses around um, products or services that help kids in Colorado. And Jess, you've been such a big part of that. Um, And I'm so excited to have you take that and run with it. Um, But those two things were really fun and important. And of course, the Bow Wow Buddies Foundation. How could I forget that? Yeah, you can't forget Um, that. Yeah. As we built Camp Bow Wow, we um, built a big charity alongside it called the Bow Wow Buddies Foundation. And we rehomed or found homes for over 10,000 rescue dogs over the years we built Camp Bow Wow and raised you know, almost a million dollars for um, can- can- cancer research and all kinds of other projects. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's such amazing work um, that you've done and, and you've been exposed to a lot of different things. So we talked about, you know, you, you're in, in the professional world and you're in the entrepreneurship world. Now you're in the nonprofit world and you're helping giving back. Was this the time when you th- you think like those notions of politics as a next venture were kind of setting in while you're playing in this nonprofit world? Kind of. I mean, I was on the business school board at CU at University of Colorado, and then I transitioned to the foundation board, which oversees the endowment for the university. And um, President Bruce Benson at the time and one of the regents said to me, you should think about running for regent at University of Colorado. You love CU. You love education reform. I'd helped open some charter schools and was really passionate about education. And you love politics. I was like, oh, that's weird. I don't really understand what a regent does. But in Colorado, we elect our regents. And we're one of only four states that does that. And so I thought, this is kind of a cool mix of all the things I love. So I ended up putting my hat in the ring in late 2015 to run for regent statewide at the University of Colorado. And uh, a couple weeks after I jumped in the race, a very formidable um, opponent jumped in. And so I had to really up my game and get to know how to run a campaign. And um, my competitive juices were there and my feistiness. And so in 2016, I ran statewide and won the race when I shouldn't have, all the odds were against me. But this little doggy daycare entrepreneur who cared about kids in college um, got across the finish line and I've been a regent for almost six years now. That's amazing. Tell us a little bit more about what a regent does, because I, I think a lot of people, not even in Colorado, understands, you know, what what that entails as a job and as a as a uh, a political office, right? Yeah, that's that's for sure. I spend a lot of time describing what a regent does. Um, so it's like the board of directors for the university system, and in Colorado, the CU system is a five billion dollar budget and contributes over $12 billion to the economy every year. And it's the third largest employer in the state. So there's nine regents, one from each congressional district. And then now there's one at large, uh, which are statewide. And so we make decisions like hiring and firing the president of the CU system. And so it's not just CU Boulder, it's UCCS, CU Denver, and CU Anschutz. And we also oversee the budget. Um, I was the chair of the finance committee, the chair of the audit committee, So it's pretty intense and you don't get paid for the position, um, but it's a labor of love. And it's really, you know, you're one of the leaders on education in Colorado when you do this. Yeah, it's super interesting. I remember when you were running for it, I was learning about it because it's it's interesting. Like you're you're almost like you're on a board of directors of this, you know, multi-billion dollar corporation, but then you also have this influence of politics and education and and how it impacts the state. And it's a really interesting position, really interesting way that Colorado goes about um, the, the election piece, which is representative of the people because, you know, see you in their budget, like you said, it's, it's a huge effect on our local economy. So very interesting. So now, you know, you've been a regent for probably four or five years. I'm jumping ahead because I know the story. So what where are you, you know, you've been now six years, but four or five years ago, you start thinking about this. Where Tell our listeners where you're at today and what your next step in the journey is. Well, if you go back about um, a little over two years ago, at mid- summer of 2020, I was thinking about what my next steps would be. And if I wanted to stay in politics, I'd been pretty involved in the party in Colorado and I'm um, running some ballot initiatives. And I'm the only, it, like, 
after Senator Cory Gardner um, left his office, I was the only statewide elected Republican left. And so a lot of people were saying, what do you want to do? And I thought, well, I don't want to go to D.C., but I love our state with all my heart. I want to try and get Colorado in, put in a different direction. And so why don't I run against um, the current governor? And people were like, what? That's crazy. There's no way. And we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? Yeah. And so I started moving that direction and researching it. And then I got diagnosed with a brain tumor. I was having headaches, really bad headaches behind my ear. And it wasn't cancerous. It's called a meningenoma, but I had to have brain surgery and it was really scary. And so this was August of 2020. I come right out of the, middle brain of the pandemic, tumor. right? Having me yeah, right in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. And um, things were just nuts. And so I came through brain surgery and I sat on the couch during the election of 2020 and watched what happened. And I was like, gosh, I still want to run, but I'm, you know, going through this crazy health thing. A couple months later, I meet with my advisors and my husband and they're like, you're obviously not going to run for governor now, are you? And I said, au contraire, <laughs> um, when they took out the tumor, they took out my filter. I'm feistier than ever. I'm ready to go. And they all looked at me like, what? I said, why don't you just chill and you know, think about this for a few months. So instead I launched a podcast called Heidi's Colorful Colorado to travel the state and meet people and see if I thought it was viable to do this. And if people were as upset as I was about what was happening in the state, I decided they were. So I waited for my one-year MRI to make sure everything was good. Um, that was August 26th of 21 and jumped in the race September 14th. Wow. Wow. So it's almost like you took that, you know, medical diagnosis that, that, that scare really. And you thought about, Hey, what, what more, not that you haven't done anything up to that point, like you've already <laughs> done a lot, but like, what more can I do with my life? And I think for you, it's really been on this, this transition to this path of service, right? Out of entrepreneurship into nonprofit and into now service. Um, cause I think we forget sometimes like our, our politically elected officials are, they're, they're serving the community and they're serving, um, the electorate. So, you know, we've got a lot coming up in the next couple of months with the election and everything like that. But what do you, what do you hope for the future of Colorado and for the future for you personally? Oh, geez, Jess, I just want, um, I want Colorado to get back to that wild west mentality to, you know, no holds barred, just go do, do big things. And I want our kids to have hope again. Colorado has become a really dangerous place for kids to live right now. Um, we have one of the highest suicide rates in the country, one of the highest drug addiction rates for kids in the country, uh, and suicide for kids is one of the worst. And our kids can't read, write, or do math at grade level. 60% of them cannot. So it's not, things aren't going in the right direction. So I call myself a mom on a mission on top of my entrepreneurial like spirit and kind of go-to attitude. I think we can do better in Colorado. So I have some big, bold ideas um, that I want to see done here, like zero income tax and all in on school choice and getting back to law and order. But it's really just about making this a beautiful state for us to raise a family in and for our kids to have a bright future ahead. That's my passion. I love it. Well, before I jump into our final two questions, tell everyone that's listening how they can learn more about you or even connect with you after hearing your story of, of not just your entrepreneurial journey, but just, you know, your journey from, you know, small town kid, starting a big business, being able to sell it now to running for governor of a, of a fairly large state. So if they want to connect with you more and learn more about you. How can they do that? Well, thanks, Jess. We're on all the social media platforms. So pick, pick your poison there <laughs> and um, having a great time following the campaign. Things are really heating up. Um, and we also have a website, HeidiForGov.com. But feel free, anyone who has any questions, reach out. Um, I'm so blessed and honored to be in this position to hopefully lead our state forward and um, build a bright future for our kids and my grandkids. Um, I'm just very excited about what's ahead. And I feel very optimistic about the ability for us to turn things around and get us back on track. All right. Awesome. Okay. So final two questions. So, you know, looking back at your journey, specifically around entrepreneurship, if you had to wrap up one, your whole journey into one piece of advice for aspiring entrepreneurs, what would that be? And then just to tie in the second question after that, what do you think buy-in would say to you today after all of this? 
Actually, I think they're both the same. I think it's carpe diem, seize the day. The, the quote he used to say all the time and his attitude and his spirit of just, um, gosh, go out, make it big, do big things. You know, we get one chance at this life and it, there's no time for sitting back and waiting for other people to fix things or to make a bright future for yourself or your kids or our country or our state. So we're all in this together. So carpe diem. Awesome. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us today on How I Sold, Heidi. We'll have all um, Heidi's links in our show notes too, as well as the website, HeidiForGov.com. Best of luck in your race and thanks for sharing your story today. Thanks, Jess. Thanks for all you do. And that's Heidi Ganahl, founder of Camp Bow Wow. This mom on a mission has changed the world for dogs, kids, and we can't wait to see what's next. Thank you for listening to How I Sold, presented by Exit Factor. Please follow us on your favorite podcasting app so you don't miss an episode. Another way to support the show is by leaving a review. Find more information about How I Sold and Exit Factor, including how to be on the show at www.exitfactor.com slash howisold. Thank you.